Hi, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to whichever part of the world you are. A uh, very warm welcome to each one of you for today's uh, live session on uh, data preparation 101. Uh, this is a part of our machine learning bootcamp, which we started along with uh, in collaboration with uh, AI Engineering YouTube channel, uh, which was started by uh, Srinivasan Srivatsan. And coming to our uh, guest speaker today, uh, it is Arti. Like you know, Arti is a uh, is a lead data scientist at Alliance Belgium, where she applies data science for solving sales and marketing problems in the insurance sector there. And she's also an ex ex entrepreneur who has uh, hands on experience in business intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, we thank her uh, for joining us today, and uh, not just that. Like you know, she she also contributes and gives back to the community in her spare time. She's also an evangelist. And uh, she's currently associated with Women in Data Science, where she's an ambassador. With that, I'll let uh, Aarti take over the session. Aarti, it's all yours now. Thanks. Thanks for joining in. Thank you. Thank you, Chanakya. And uh, thank you, D5, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, whichever part of the world you are in. Uh, just a small note and uh, probably a request from my end. Uh, so yeah, Women in Data Science is an initiative by uh, Stanford. So every year, uh, we do a co conference on 8th of March on International Women's Day. And two months prior to that, there is also a datathon that happens in Kaggle. So this year, it is going to be on medical data. And the registration has been uh, opened up for this. So I will uh, ask uh, Chanakya and DeFi team to like share the link uh, in the community website uh, uh, where you can like sign up for this datathon. It is open to everyone, but it has a small condition that 50% of the team should be represented by women. Uh, because this is an organization to uh, you know promote and encourage women to participate more in uh, data science. Uh, with that note, I'll get uh, started. Uh, Chanakya, uh, you're able to see my uh, slide that I have shared? Yes, uh, yes, I'm able to see. It's, it's perfect. You can get, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. OK, OK, great, thanks. So yeah, I, I want to start with a little bit of missing uh, myth versus uh, you know, uh, reality. Uh, that is the job of a data scientist, because we are going to uh, bust a lot of myth uh, and uh, answer with the data. Uh, yeah, so on a funny note, uh, this is what people think we do. But what we actually do is uh, this. What that means uh, is uh, we end up doing a lot of data cleaning as compared to uh, you know uh, 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 the other work. So uh, before that, I will go on to uh, explaining a little bit of this machine learning process. So we start with the business objective. Uh, we gather uh, what data that we want. We collect the data. We do a little bit of exploratory analysis, understand the data, prepare the data, and then move on to the model building, evaluation, and deployment. Uh, today's focus is going to be on this, uh, which is exploratory data analysis and data preparation. Uh, we assess data quality and clean. Uh, we transform the variables, and then we split it into train and test uh, so that it is ready for modeling. And this is a very iterative process because we go back from the modeling phase. We understand the data. Some uh, information could have been collected, uh, and uh, some information can be transformed better. So the, this entire four step is actually very iterative. And what happens in reality is that 79% of the time uh, in any machine learning uh, activity is spent on uh, data collection and data cleaning. So that is why this is a very important step uh, to keep in mind uh, before we move on to the modeling phase. What is data preparation? So data preparation is the process of collecting data from several sources and then profiling, cleaning, enriching and combining them to derive a holistic set that can help you in your model. So profiling is uh, in understanding your data. Cleaning is, of course, uh, if you have any uh, quality issues, you clean uh, and enrich the data. If you can add, see if you can add more data from external sources, right? Like we have a lot of open data sets today, and the government also keeps publishing uh, open data sets. So can we use those to enrich our data set? and combine all of them into a derived data set for using an analytical process. Why do we need data preparation? Garbage in, garbage out. This is something that uh, you will always hear, uh, because what you feed your model is what you get out. So you feed poor quality data, and poor prediction is what you get. And poor models lead to poor decisions. And poor decision costs a lot uh, to the business. As per uh, Gartner's survey, that is almost uh, you know, to the tune of 15 million in a financial year. 
understanding the data. So uh, understand your data from the perspective of solving the business problem. So the first question that you need to ask is what problem you are solving. So are, are you, for example, predicting the uh, COVID number? Like how many uh, numbers will, how many people will get test positive, uh, test, uh, positive tomorrow? Uh, or are you going to like predict an occurrence? Like, is it going to rain tomorrow or not? So you need to understand your goal to be able to understand your data as well. And then you need to separate the data from noise. Uh, this will also be covered uh, in model evaluation because some of uh, the models are very good in uh, handling the data from noise. So are you using relevant variables? Uh, for example, now, uh, it is very easy to collect a lot of data and storage is also cheap, but using the right data is only going to help uh, in improving the prediction. Are the variables you're using has an impact on the business decision making? Like for example, can the business do something if you give, uh, let's say a feature importance of that data? So for example, uh, let's say uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a salesman who is trying to sell more and you are going to like say yeah uh, you know a particular uh, location he has more uh, probability of selling there is only so much he can sell in that place at one point in time it's going to saturate and he has to move on to location b so then you need to focus more on the customer aspects than on the aspects which the business cannot control and using all the columns could also cause discrimination. This is something that uh, has been getting a lot of attention in the recent past is uh, the models carrying the bias of the human beings as well. So the models are also discriminating as much as we do. So uh, especially like gender, uh, race, uh, economic status, etc., are all very sensitive data and be very careful in using those in model building. Assessing the data quality. So uh, there could be a data type error. Uh, for example, uh, a text column can have a number, a number column ha can have a uh, uh, date and data format error. So uh, like for example, a date format is a DDMM or MMDD or is it totally something else and missing values. Uh, so sometimes there could be errors in the data so that uh, the data points might not have been captured and then outliers, uh, anomalies, like extreme values that can ha occur in your uh, data, and then duplicates. We will cover each of these along with a uh, uh, hands-on uh, code and uh, data set. We will take the Titanic data set for this. Uh, this is one of uh, you know uh, good knowledge uh, data set. This is about uh, some of the variables from the uh, Titanic survivors. So this is about predicting whether someone survived or not based on their, uh, you know, few variables, which is, uh, let's go through one by one. One is uh, the uh, class that they were traveling in, first class, second class, or third class, whether it's a female or male, what is their age, how, uh, how, sorry, how many number of siblings were traveling along with them, or how many number of uh, parents and children were traveling along with them, the ticket number, uh, how much they paid for buying the ticket, uh, which is a fair uh, cabin number, what is their allocated cabin number, and where did they embark, where did they uh, board the ship, uh, three locations in the United Kingdom, which are, uh, you know, uh, denoted by the alphabet C, Q, and S. So I'm going to move on to the Jupyter Notebook now. So uh, one check, Chanukya, you are able to see the uh, Jupyter Notebook, and the zooming in is fine. Yes, yes, yeah, able to see. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Uh, some of the libraries that we will uh, use in this is Pandas. Uh, this is good in doing all sorts of table uh, calculations, uh, very similar uh, to Excel or SQL if you have already used that. Uh, NumPy, it's a data analysis and data manipulating tool. Uh, yeah, random generator and visualization tools. So we will see where this is being used uh, at the end. So let's let's start with importing the data. So our data is in a CSV format, and then we use read underscore CSV to import our data. And shape will give the number of row and columns in your data. So this is like a matrix. So in this example, so you have 891 rows and then 12 columns, and then uh, you have a training data and the test data. So here you have 418 rows and 11 columns. What is the difference? In training data, you have the 12th column, which is your target variable called survival. So whether someone survived or not is denoted by zero or one. 
and that is not there in your test data. Why? Because uh, the model will learn from the trained data and then predict it on the test data. So you will be predicting the survivor uh, probability on the test data. So that's why you have one less column. And uh, dot D types will give you the list of columns in your data sets along with their type. So integer, int is like integer, it's a numeric with a decimal. Object is a string. Float 64 is a whole number. And then uh, let's look at like the first uh, column contents. So there is a passenger ID, which is like one, two, three, four, five. So it's an index. Survived, so it's a zero or one. P class is again one, two, three. So first class, second class, and third class. It contains name. Uh, with uh, with salutation, and then whether uh, that particular uh, one, passenger. One yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. So can we go a little uh, slow on the pace? I mean, that's that's the request from some of the participants. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I think it's going great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Thanks for that feedback. Uh, so what we have here is uh, the sex, whether someone is a male or female, and then uh, age. How old are they? And then the siblings versus spouse. So, they, so for example, this person, Mr. Owen Harris, is traveling with uh, one sibling or a spouse. So this is sibling or a spouse. Uh, he's not traveling with any parent or a child. So that's why PARCH is zero. And then a ticket number. And then how much he paid. And then what cabin number. So NAN in the data set means missing values. And then where did he embark? So it's in S. So uh, it, it's in uh, Southampton, right? So train.head will give you like the first five rows. You can also determine how many rows you want to see there. You, if you want to like look at like the first 10 rows, that will also happen. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is the index in pandas will always start with a zero. It doesn't start with one. So that's why here uh, you see when you ask for 10, you get like zero to nine. Uh, OK. and. Uh, Maybe I can, uh, you know, quickly open this uh, data once in uh, an Excel file and then show that as well. So this is how our data is. So this is what we end up seeing in the panda. So this is a comma separated file, CSV file. Uh, so each column is separated by a comma. And uh, read.csv will automatically uh, identify the separator and then read it into a pandas table. Right. So uh, moving on, we want to assess if there are any uh, missing values uh, in our column. Right. So train dot is not. So this is going to give. This is going to take into consideration all the columns and sum the number of rows where it is null, right? So, and then what we are seeing beneath is we are printing only the columns that has, uh, you know, uh, blanks. Maybe if I can show. So the output will come like this. So wherever you see zero, there are no missing values in these columns. And in age, cabin, and embark, we have missing values. So that is not that is what we need to understand in detail. And uh, in number of rows, it is 177. But in proportion, it is 19.8%. So 19.8% of our data has uh, missing age. 77 of them have missing cabin. And uh, yeah, negligent percentage has embarked also missing. We do the same analysis on the test data as well, uh, you know, to understand how uh, the test data is also. Uh, are there any missing values in test data which we need to impute uh, before we uh, load it into our model? Train dot describe. Okay, so what this function will do is it will it is going to take all the numeric columns and give a summary statistics on those columns, right? Uh, for example, uh, passenger ID, survived, B class, age, siblings. Uh, count of uh, parents or children fed. These are all the numeric columns in our table. So when I say numeric, it will take both integer and uh, float as well. And count is number of rows. Mean is the average standard deviation. So how much it deviates from the mean? What is the minimum value? 
and this is 25%, 50%, and 75% are quartile. So the 50% is usually our median. And then we have the maximum value in this. So passenger ID is a, um, it, it's a ID column. So that's why you have like one as a beginning and then 891. So it's an ID. So it's one row per, uh, uh, you know, incremental uh, row. Whereas survived is actually a categorical column. It's zero or one. And uh, there it is uh, doing an average of that as well. Similarly, P class is, uh, you know, one, two, and three. It is also a categorical column. We will later see how this can be converted. And then age is a number that we want to understand. So 704, 14, uh, because the remaining is missing. The average is 29.6. That's the average age of people uh, from our data sets. And it deviates 14.5. Five. So 29 plus or minus 14.5 is uh, the standard deviation from the mean. And then uh, you have the number of siblings, pa uh, parent or children, and then fair as well. So if you look at, uh, uh, you know, these, you can understand how the data is spread. This is also something uh, for people who don't want to code. Uh, sorry. So this is a GUI option for uh, pandas. So running this on the data set is going to help me, you know, look at my table. Uh, and then it helps me in adding filters. If I want, instead of coding, you can add your filters over here. You can look at the same summary statistics that we uh, added, like from, uh, you know, dot describe. Uh, and then this helps in creating the column. Four. So for example, uh, we can choose histogram and let's look at the survived column, how this is distributed between people who survived and people who uh, didn't. So when I drag and drop this on the x-axis and color on the uh, y uh, color uh, variable, so it's going to give me a graph, which is, a, this is how our data is distributed. So 549 people survived uh sorry uh, survived is equal to zero so 549 people died and uh 342 people survived so this is my data split and you can use this for uh any other column so if you want to like add uh you know one more uh variable to it you can uh, uh do so by creating like a bar or a box plot whatever you want so this is like a good way if you don't want to get started with the uh, coding uh, this gives you a platform to play around with your data to understand your data so uh, we also have to understand the categorical variable so sex is a categorical variable so what we mean by a categorical variable is anything that is uh, not unique uh, sorry uh, not uh, numeric it is a text column and it is going to frequently occur in our data and we need to understand how many times it occurred what is the proportion what that column means so value counts will actually count the number of uh, uh, times it occurs in our data so in our data split 577 uh, observations are male and 314 are female similarly in mbac majority of them 644 of them uh you know boarded from uh southampton and a few of them from uh, uh c and q the other two locations uh where they boarded and survived yeah 549 and 342 so this is what we checked in our uh, gui bar graph uh and then uh the percentage so 61 percent of them did not survive and 38 percent of them survived and dropping irrelevant columns. So what are we trying to do here? We are trying to predict if someone survived or not. So a few of the things that are going to help us in predicting that is uh, 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 which gender they belong. Because if you have, of course, seen the movie, they try to evacuate women and children first. And then the age, they also try to evacuate the elderly people first uh, because the younger can survive the temperature as well as can swim for some time. And uh, also the class matters because this is how uh, there were decks in uh, the ship and uh, you had like, uh, you know, uh, third class, second class and first class in like different levels. So depending upon uh, which part of the ship they were, uh, if they were on the side of the uh, ship where the iceberg was hit, 
so the water was uh, flowing uh, faster and uh, flooding the lower levels so which is usually where the third class and then second class and the first class so that is going to help us but when a name of a person is not going to help us uh, a ticket uh, number like so we don't care about the ticket number these two are irrelevant uh, you know uh, information and then passenger id so we have the id that is already created by uh, you know pandas sometimes this passenger id can also be used as an index instead of the uh, id created by uh, pandas in that case you can use set index as a code and give the column name which should be uh, taken as a index like for example if you're working on a website data the session id could become the index and then you can uh, you know connect back to the session id for prediction later so yeah, now looking at the train data. Uh, so we saw that, uh, you know, we had like some missing values. Sometimes the numeric missing values could be zero. So that is something that we should keep in mind. Uh, let me let me go back uh, a little bit to the... Uh, Aarti, one mm -hmm. quick thing before mm -hmm. we jump in, like now we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind addressing them. Uh, so one is uh, basically i think people are uh, asking about when they should split i mean when they should split the data before uh, splitting it into when they should uh, go with the uh, with okay so basically they wanted to know when when they should uh, split it into train and test data before imputing the missing values or something yeah okay uh, usually yeah uh, so in this case we had the train and test data separately from kaggle but you always uh, uh, do the missing value imputation data cleaning everything on your data first and then uh, split it we have another example on that as well on how we split it so which will also be covered uh, later uh, i will emphasize there but ideal scenario is to do all the data cleaning data preparation st stuff on the whole data and then split it into train and validation Uh, any more questions, uh, Chanakya? No, uh, and the other thing is, uh, j uh, people just wanted to know how did we land into a GUI? I think you just imported that, right? Probably if you can show that once again. Oh, yes, I, I, will, I will. Yes, yes. sure, sure. Yes. So this is, okay, so Pandas is the, uh, okay, maybe. So Pandas GUI is another uh, package that we have. So we import show from Pandas and then we use, uh, you know, show of our data sets. So train, DF, whatever your data set name is. So the moment uh, you do that, it is going to give a pop up, which is nothing but instead of looking at it in a Jupyter notebook, you look at it in a, a user, a better user interface uh, screen, like how you do it in your Excel file. And uh, you can, so this is the data frame that you see and uh, another one is a uh, filter so where you, if you want to like filter for a particular uh, age greater than 20 or age less than one if you want to look at the babies and then like some summary statistics it will also give you the type uh, that i showed as dot d types so basically this is a better thing uh, if you are new to uh, python and pandas to just load your data which is read underscore csv let me go a little bit back so here you load your data and you assign it uh, to a variable called train. And then immediately you can go to this uh, pandas GUI and then display it as a GUI so that all the D type describe, uh, you know, uh, visualizations that instead of doing it by code, uh, you can do it in a better interface. Uh, because programming is the easiest part that you can figure out. Uh, understanding the data and asking right questions from the data is very important. So please focus on that, that rather than uh, you know uh, understanding the code when you start. Because coding is always you can you know get some help from Google, but domain knowledge and experience is what uh, you gain by more and more practice. And similarly here in the graph also, maybe I'll do it one more time. You select the graph that you want and then drag and drop on the X axis, the variable that you want. The same variable, if you don't put it on color, what you will see is the single color, but between zero and one. And if you drag and drop it on the color, you're going to see it in like different colors, but it, it, it's, it's all the same. And uh, if you want to use a different, uh, you know, bar graph, if you want to like, uh, you know, know, uh, uh, yeah. So, 
how many people uh, you know survived oops sorry i should have put that in uh, color as well my bad Uh, okay, it's taking it as a, a numeric column. That's why it is giving a grade. Uh, but otherwise, it will give you a distinct color between how many people within uh, uh, female who died and survived and within male who died and uh, survived. Oh, is so, that okay? Yeah, yeah. Also, one quick question. How does the described data mm -hmm. reveal? Or how do I read this? 25% died, did not survive. 50% died, did not survive. And 75%. Yeah. This so one? Like maybe describe data, I think. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, this one, uh, train.describe. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, what this does is it just takes all the numeric columns from your data. So this does not uh, split your data between a numeric data or categorical data. So sometimes you will have ranking one, two, three. So the one, two, three doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you have to add all the ones together or twos together or threes together. It is not a numerical data, but the ordinal data. So Pandas doesn't know that difference. So in this case, what you need to do is uh, you need to use a, a string function to transform this from a numeric. So survived is a categorical data. So zeros and ones uh, have a yes or no meaning. So because it's a zero to one, it is reading as a numerical. We need to convert it into a text data. So th that's why I said passenger ID survived and P class. Pl please do not look at these values because these would have been uh, categorical. But look at the age. So the average age of people who were uh, there is 29.6 and the maximum age is 80 and the minimum is 0 0.42. 0 0.42 means like those many number of, uh, I mean, it, it's a month old baby that was there on the ship. And then similarly, number of siblings, number of uh, parents, uh, this is also something that uh, you can make sense because uh, these three are uh, originally a numeric data as well. And then the fair. So this is also a numeric data. So the average ticket price is uh, 32 pounds, 32.2 pounds in Titanic. The highest price is 512 pounds. So that, that must be from the first class. And the minimum is zero, which means here what you need to make sure that, OK, someone cannot uh, travel for free. Maybe that is a missing uh, value. So the numeric data's missing value may not be always NAN or blanks. It can also be zero. Thanks. Yeah, okay. I think we can we can carry on. Yeah, thanks. Sure, sure. So uh, maybe I'll go through everything uh, once a little bit. So yeah, we looked at the percentage of survived uh, versus not survived. So sixty one percent of the people did not survive, and thirty eight percent survived. We are deleting irrelevant columns for our data. So the columns that does not make any sense being in the input for model building. So we, so someone whether someone survives or not is not going to be you know, based on their name or the ticket number or even their ID that they were uh, using, right? So these are the columns that we will uh, delete because irrelevant column reduces. It's actually a cost on your model. It reduces the predictability. And uh, here, uh, uh, so few missing columns in the fair. So uh, let me go back to the slide because there are a few things that I want to show as well. Uh, So how to fix data type error? So for example, numerical value in a string column or string value in a date column. So if this error is at the source data level, uh, it is difficult to fix because you need to go back and correct it at the source system from where you're extracting. Some data quality checks is uh, at the data collection stage itself is uh, important. For example, if you are setting up a form or something to collect your data, you can uh, you know, uh, put data validation checks. Uh, so most of the time you would have uh, seen if you have to enter your OTP in a banking website, it will automatically show only the numeric keyboard in your mobile phone instead of a QWERTY keyboard, right? So like that, you can fix uh, the data quality at the source stage itself. Treat them as a missing value because once it is in your data, if, if it is from the source system and you can't go back and fix it, you have to treat it as a missing value and impute it. We also see how to treat missing values later. 
how to fix data format error. So for example, if you see a, a GDMMYY in the MMDDYY column, so how do you see it? Sometimes this could also be because uh, the data would have been collected in a MMDDYY format. You might get that data in an Excel file, but your system settings could be in uh, the other format, DDMM. So in that case, uh, what you can do is you can import that as a string column. And then once you know the existing data format, you can use that. Like for example, this function to date time will convert a string to a date function, date uh, field. And then it will take an input, which is this. And you also give what format your data is. And so you're saying it is DMY and then HMS. So if it is just a DMY, then you will remove all this HMS. So you can specify in which format uh, your data can be. Uh, uh, yeah, in, the, in what form, format your data can be uh, read by the pandas. missing values. So these are uh, the missing value treatments. So what we can do is we can either delete it if there are not too many uh, there, or we can impute it. What impute means is you fill in for what is missing by making some assumptions or calculations. Deletions means pairwise deletion. So you only delete the missing value. For example, in our column, we had age missing. So the pandas by default calculates the mean by ignoring the uh, missing value. So if we had 890 values uh, in our data set, but only 770 have age, the average will be divided, sum of age divided by 770 instead of 891. And uh, list wise or dropping entire row. So if something is blank, you can delete that row. And uh, you can drop, drop the entire column. So if there are too many missing values, but that's a problem only for that column and remaining columns are uh, intact, then you can uh, remove that column. And when you impute, there are two different. One is a general or simple format and another one is advanced. Advanced is like where you create an algorithm to fill it. Uh, but let's look at a simple uh, imputation for today. So for a non-time series data, you either impute it with a constant. Uh, for example, if you want to be able to, uh, if, if you know the business problem and if you don't want the model to mistake that with something else, then you impute, create a different constant. And then later in the model, you will be able to filter out based on that constant and uh, look at those uh, observations alone from the model prediction. Similarly, imputing with mean, median, or mode. Uh, so if it's a numeric value, you can impute it with mean or median. And mode is most frequent occurred. So uh, for categorical variables, you can do that. So for today, we will look at deletions, like if we are going to delete into a row or a column. And then uh, we will also uh, you know, look at imputing with a constant or a mean or median. I'm going back to the... All right, so we saw there are missing values and uh, yeah. So this is an example for deleting the rows, right? This is dropping entire rows or list wise deletion. So we have a fair that is equal to zero. We consider that to be a missing value and then we drop it. So train dot shape, what is the size of my data before I delete those rows? It was 891 rows and after I have 876. So we, we are not losing uh, too much about, uh, you know, less than 20 rows uh, over there. And then we can create imputation rules. Uh, so SK, ASK Learn has a import, uh, simple imputer. So this is, uh, you know, well calculate uh, whatever you want, like a mean or median or mode. And then for wherever it is missing, it will impute that value. So let me run through the code a little bit. So what we are doing is we are assigning the imputer function. And then we are saying, what is the missing values in our data? So the data has np.nan. Instead of that, it is going to have 0. You can like specify it as 0 over here. Sorry, 0 over here instead of np.nan. So you, what you are telling the code is, look for these missing values in my data. And then the strategy that I want you to follow is to mean, uh, average it. So look for blanks, average my column, and then replace that. So in this case, let us try doing that on age. 
So I'm, I'm saying like uh, fit it on the column, uh, my data frame and age. And then I'm assigning uh, the new uh, age column with this uh, mean. So this uh, mean dot imputer dot transform will identify uh, calculate the mean, identify the missing values and impute that. So similarly, categorical for embark, we are going to use the most frequent method, which is the mold. So what I will do is, uh, I will do this and also show you how it will come in the output data. Right. So here. This 29.645 is the average. So this was blank in the previous uh, data. So if I have to like go here, so we had a missing value over here. So in wherever it was missing, this 29.6 has been imputed. And uh, similarly for uh, this MBAT, so if you want to look at that as well, So it has taken yes. So yes is the most frequently occurred value from what we saw. So it has imputed with the most frequently occurred for the categorical variable. Uh, instead, you can also, uh, you know, this code, what is an alternative method that is being uh, discussed here is a constant uh, impute. So for example, you don't have to use the most frequent method. You can like say A or not available or something like that. So that later in the output of the model, you can still trace it back to the rows that had missing values. OK, uh, we are moving on uh, from missing values uh, to, uh, you know, uh, outlier. Uh, any questions so far, Chanukya? Okay. Uh, shall I proceed? Yeah, I think I think we can proceed. But yeah, I think uh, people were asking, what mm -hmm. is do what does dot travel do? And also, some of them were asking, is uh, is removing mess, uh, missing values the best way or like, you know, in typically like, you know, what do we prefer in the industry in terms of uh, sure. treating missingness? Uh, okay. Best practices? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of uh, dot travel, I I'm not going to get into the code too much. Uh, I'm also available in uh, the DeFi Slack community and you can also post in the discussion. So uh, today's objective is to understand how the data preparation works and uh, you know how we can uh, how, how it is being done what is like the thumb rule uh, things like that uh, regarding the code i will take those questions uh, offline and uh, you can reach out to me uh, there uh, on answering the second question for how we uh, deal with missing values uh, like i said it is a very uh, intuitive method so the more you work with the data the more you get a uh, better intuition you can figure it out uh, but to begin with uh, so pairwise deletions you will use uh, for example when you have uh, when you don't have like too much of uh, missing values or that is not going to impact you in a way in a in a in a bigger way uh, you drop again entire row here you need to keep in mind that you are not deleting too many rows in our example uh, 20 less than 20 rows out of 890 is not a problem but if you're going to have uh, like some 100 rows that are going to be black 100 rows are going to be deleted because of this then it is a problem so you're you're uh, you know uh, losing out uh, more than 10 percent of your data and in case of a column uh, uh, yeah this is one of the if there are like too many missing values it is better to drop the column because uh, you just have to assume that uh, you don't have the data and uh, move on because uh, dropping columns is better than dropping entire row. So in in case of ordering, so you go from pairwise uh, to column and then to entire row. Uh, and then uh, 
uh, again with mean and median imputation sometimes you need to also understand without the missing value whether your data contains outlier or not so after this i will cover outlier but uh, if your data contains outlier then you have to uh, do a certain uh, methodology and if it doesn't uh, then you have to uh, use a certain methodology you need to understand outlier first before that uh, and uh, uh, yeah so mean the problem with mean is it is uh, in measure of central tendency it is uh, affected uh, by outlier a lot whereas median is a positional central tendency uh, so if you have an outlier or if you have extremely skewed data, it is better to go with median than uh, mean. And usually you uh, impute it with a constant uh, when you want to be able to uh, trace it back uh, in the output of your model. Uh, so you want to know uh, some probabilities. Uh, the model is built on some missing data and the probability for certain observations could be a little flawed because you didn't have the in that particular information. So you want to be able to uh, look at that later. I think uh, uh, that's about it. And, and any more questions? Uh, one one suggestion I would uh, uh, advise for people who are just getting started is to like do all of these on your data and look at your model prediction. Finally, what is the accuracy that you're getting? Which uh, method has a lot more uh, impact on your model? And because of this missing value treatment, is your data, is your model uh, output is getting uh, an underfed or overfed problem? So if you do it iteratively for the same set of data, different methodologies, you start building an intuition over a time. Yeah, I think I'll be getting more. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay yeah. great. Okay. Outliers. What is an outlier? In simple term, it's an anomaly. So it's a it's a rare event, or it's something that shouldn't uh, be in your data in a normal scenario, right? So uh, we will generally define outliers as sample that are exceptionally far from the mainstream of the data, right? Like so, for example, in the age column in Titanic, if you had like seen someone with a age of 110, then that's an outlier. So anywhere between zero to 80 seems to be fine. Average, uh, you know, the, the age of uh, survival probably in UK at that point in time was 80. Uh, but 110 or 115 is an outlier, right? So what what is that you need to understand about uh, outliers is that like, why does it happen in your data? So is it because uh, of some input error or uh, some fault in the measurement? Or is it be because of like some data corruption and then is it like a true outlier? Should you still retain it in your data so that you also uh, you know, uh, account for those outliers? So for example, uh, Michael Jordan in basketball or uh, some other player who has an exceptional record will be an outlier when you compare it with uh, the other people, right? Like if you want to compare Roger Federer or someone else, of course, they will be a true outlier. So you need to keep that in mind. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, the other problem is that uh, as this picture that sees over here, so you try to fit your data, but like outlier might, uh, you know, skew your data and uh, take the model prediction accuracy for a toss. So this is why you need to, uh, you know, uh, treat the outlier. So outlier can be in numeric string and date. Uh, for example, uh, let us look at examples for string and date and for numeric, uh, we will do a hands on. String is uh, if, if you have a city name that is mentioned in a country or you have like some gibberish data that shouldn't even be there. So that's that's uh, that's a uh, outlier and date. Like so, for example, you are only looking at last three years data, but in that you have like something with date 1990, then that's an outlier. Sometimes outlier could also be because of missing values or data quality issues. So you need to keep that in mind. Uh, it can be a univariate outlier. For example, within the same column, you have exceptions. Like I said, age. Within age, you have like some exceptions, uh, right? Like so, uh, someone with like 0.4, we saw like almost months old baby to 80 years old. So within the column, do you see any outliers? So uh, and then multivariate. So you take two columns and then compare. Uh, and understand the relationship between them. So for example, in, in this, so what you see here, uh, height uh, box plot and weight box plot, 
and then like when you plot it together so do you see any exceptions on the combination you understand how uh, height and weight evolves it is almost always uh, you know uh, directly proportional but do you see any deviation there we use uh, two methods uh, i mean let today i mean we have many methods to uh, detect outliers but look, today we will look at two methods one is the standard deviation so when your data is normally distributed uh, your mean and median and mean, uh, uh, mode are equal so which is over here uh, oh, sorry mean equal to uh, median equal to mode and then you have your standard deviation outlier is anything that lies on a uh, mean minus 3 sigma and mean plus 3 sigma so 99.7% of the data gets covered in this and 0.3% are outliers so we will use this method to identify numeric outliers and another method we will uh, use is in the quartile region so quartile is the way uh, uh, is the division of data into you know four uh, splits uh, three points and four intervals and uh so this is a minimum to your q1 and your q1 to q3 is the interquartile region so your 75th percentile minus your 25th percentile will give you the interquartile region the lower whisker is calculated by the q1 minus 1.5 time, times of iqr and the maximum is q3 plus 1.5 times of iqr so this is another method uh, of uh, identifying outlier detection and median is what like your 50 percent is this is another your uh, central uh, measure so in this it's it's a perfect fit uh, so where you have uh, you know this is almost normal distribution but there are also cases where it will not be a normal distribution whereas like your box will be skewed somewhere over here L let's look at uh, that as an example uh, in the hands-on code uh yeah some of the other outlier detection method or uh, these uh, this presentation is already shared and uh, if you have uh, if you want to dig deeper into this please uh, feel free to reach out to me or uh, we will also share some reading materials for this uh, but these are the things that we will not cover today i just wanted to show that uh, you know there are different methods for outlier calculation okay so Two numeric data that we have is age and fair. Let, let's look at, let's apply both the outlier methods to understand whether we have outlier in our data, right? Uh, so we are calculating the mean over here. So you take uh, age column and then calculate the mean, and then you calculate the average. You calculate the lower end by multiplying the standard deviation with minus three so that you get the lower end, lower limit. And then you multiply it with plus three to get the higher limit. So uh, our average is 29.6, standard deviation is 30, and minus 39.22 plus 39.2 is our uh, range. Uh, anything outside this will be an outlier. So here the problem is that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I should have done this plus. So I'm detecting three standard deviation from mean and added, adding three standard deviation from the mean. Oops. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so minus nine to 68.7, right? So we have, uh, you know, uh, sorry. So this is lower limit. We want to know if we have anyone below lower limit. And then we want to know if there are anyone uh, higher than the lower limit in our data. Minus nine cannot be possible because age cannot be negative. So the maximum it could be is like, you know, zero or uh, it should be greater than zero. Zero still means missing. Uh, sorry. So we are checking if we have anything, uh, you know, uh, greater than this in our data, right? So this is what we are checking with. Similarly, we are doing the same thing in uh, the fair as well. Uh, so plus or minus uh, code. Same thing, 
let us look at the IQR. So in IQR, we are calculating Q25, quartile 25, and then Q75. And then we are calculating the interquartile region and then the cutoff. So K is 1.5 times over here. So basically, this code is uh, doing the same uh, uh, you know, formula that uh, you see over here. So Q1 minus 1.5 times of IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 times of IQR. And then you want to filter out uh, whether there are any outlier age, right? So here, if you do a box plot, what this is doing is it is taking fair column and from the data train, and then uh, 1.5 times is the value that get. you can even do this for three as well, uh, depending upon your data requirement, if you want to be really lenient or strict uh, with your outlier treatment. And then this gives uh, the box plot. So like I said, it need not be a perfect, uh, it there, it can be uh, like this as well. Another example for multivariate is let's look at the class and the fair, right? So within uh, first class, second class, and third class, we are seeing if there are any fair outliers. So first class, second class, and third class, and we have some uh, outliers over here. How do we treat uh, outliers? Mean, median, or random imputation or constant imputation, very similar to how we did in uh, uh, you know, uh, missing value treatment. You can drop the values. This is also very similar to missing value treatment. You can put a ceiling on the outlier. So if you know about your data, then you can put a ceiling on that. So if you know the outermost limit, let's say it's a percentage column, and you know for sure the percentage cannot be greater than 100. So then you can see all your uh, you can put a ceiling on all your outlier where anything greater than 100 will take the value of 100. Uh, bottom or zero encoding is when you know the lower limit uh, for the data. Like if you know what is the lowest that your data can have, then you will remove all the outliers and replace it with the lowest value that your data can get. In the same manner, what zero encoding means is that if your data cannot be negative, like it's an age or it's a weight, or some, it's a height, it cannot be negative, then you can uh, put everything to be zero or a little more than zero if, if zero is not a value that it can take, right? Another thing is uh, you can bin the data together. Uh, I will show that as example as well. Uh, what binning means is you group your data. So for example, uh, if there is age, so zero to 10, 10 to 20, and anything uh, greater than 70, you group it together. So even if you have uh, 120 or 110 as an age, they fall in the, under the last category. So that, uh, you know, uh, this helps in reducing the impact of outliers on your uh, model. Yeah, let me go back to the code. Yeah. So here, uh, what we are doing is based on the minimum and uh, maximum. Here, let us say we have like five uh, bins, five groups that you want to create, right, on the age. So anything greater than all the outliers will get covered in bin five. If you want to be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, lenient with your data, and you want to have the distribution in a much more granular level, you can change the bin to ten, and then, yeah, nine and ten might have your outliers, but the split between bin one to seven is much more clearer. So, if you want more uh, clarity, if you want the data, the model to be robust between these, then you can use this. Again, this is also an iterative method, and you need to be able to practice different things on the same set of data to be able to understand how uh, this works. Uh, or any questions on the outliers? Uh, Arti, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, before we jump in there. So there is one question, why 1.5 times of IQR or Y3? So you spoke about uh, interquartile range, right? Yes. So I yeah, think yeah. Uh, there are some questions around it. Yeah. So here, uh, OK, this is the property of normal distribution. So here, uh, 68, if, if the data follows a normal distribution, uh, you know, 68% uh, of your data will get covered in uh, 
mean plus uh, mean minus one sigma to mean plus one sigma, and uh, similarly two to minus two times sigma will cover ninety five percent of the data, and then minus three will cover ninety nine point seven percent of the data. So this is uh, for normal distribution, and uh, again uh, this one this one point five times is a, a thumb rule. It can also be three if you if you know the data is inherently skewed and you want to. uh not uh be very uh, strict with your data uh with 1.5 times you can also make it uh, a three okay and what do you mean by outliers for p class so maybe there was not an outlier for p class as is uh but okay yeah i yeah, i yeah, i understand so we are okay what we are doing there is it's in the notebook we are looking at multivariate uh, outliers which means sometimes when you compare two data so when you look at the data alone you might not see an outlier so if you look at the fair column alone you might see okay it ranges somewhere between like 25 pounds to uh, 2500 pounds it doesn't look uh, bad to me but if you want to look at it by another example so for example then you travel in a uh, you know economy class and a business class right uh, you will obviously not pay uh, some 1500 uh, pounds or uh, 3 lakhs or 1500 euros for an economy class right so economy class has a limit okay it it's it's going to range somewhere between 0 to 300 uh, pounds and 300 pounds to 700 pounds or 1000 pounds is going to be my uh, economy plus and 1000 pounds and above are going to be my business class right you need to check your data not just within the fair column but also with another column so if i group my data by class over here uh, right so are there any outliers so is someone who is traveling in an economy class paying 1000 euros or someone traveling in a business class pays 250 euros let's see as an example uh, right so that's why multivariate analysis helps where stand alone if you look at a column they might not have a weird uh, outlier but if you look at it with another column then you can find the outlier or data quality issues uh let's say another example where uh, based on the age you are categorizing people as infant teens adults and uh, senior citizens right if you compare age and that category from your data if a senior citizen in one column there is senior citizen in one column and the corresponding age is 5 then that is an outlier right that's a problem it is either a data quality issue or some error or maybe you need to recalculate that teen or a senior or an adult uh, uh, column again from your age if your age is correct so that's why here in the titanic example we are comparing the passenger class 1 2 and 3 with the fare to see if uh, you know first class people are paying like a little less or the third class people are paying a lot more so this is just an example that i wanted to show for multivariate uh that is is that clear yeah uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's fine yeah yeah thanks another question any other question no i, I think yeah we are we are done with it i guess i think we okay. can uh, go through uh, uh, yeah just yeah. yeah we can uh, carry and, on uh, yeah and also help me keep a tab on the time as well so this yeah, is yeah sure 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 Sure, yeah. Okay, duplicate data. Sometimes your data might have duplicates, and uh, you have to remove it uh, to avoid overfitting problems. But before removing that, you need to keep in mind that they are not real data that coincidentally have values that are identical. Uh, for example, if you want to, uh, you know, let's say you're you're running a website. and you are selling something on your website you have people coming to your website without even uh, you know logging in so in that case uh, you will have something called session id and each uh, person who comes to your website might uh, you know uh, have similar uh, characteristics so they might have clicked on your website from google ads they might be using google chrome as your default browser and they might have a ip address that is in india a lot of other characteristics right so you can have a lot of population that has the similar characteristics and those are not actually duplicate that is how your data is uh, so it's it's a nature of your data and the problem that you are uh, you know trying to solve 
and then try to figure out why you have duplicates in your data. Is it due to class imbalance, whether there were some, uh, you know, upsampling or synthetic sampling that was done before? Uh, this we also we will cover later what class imbalance means and what it means to do undersampling or oversampling later. Feature engineering, uh, feature encoding. So what feature engineering means is you have your data and it, uh, you want to transform your data in such a way that it gives more meaningful uh, output or predictions. So instead of having just age column, can you group it into a infant, teen, adults, and uh, you know, uh, senior citizens? Or can you, if you have a date of birth, can you group them into Gen Z, uh, millennials, uh, Gen X, Gen Y, boomers, whatever? Right. So can you group them? Uh, because that will help you in some form of general generalization based on your data. Again, taking the same example, if you're running a website, if you're Amazon, uh, you might not want to know the age of the each and every individual, but you want to group them into some category. So, okay, all the teenagers are buying this. Uh, of course, it, it uh, you know happens in some form of generalization, like how all the uh, toys for girls are always Barbies and uh, all the toys for boys are always monster trucks. Uh, you have to be very careful where it becomes too much of a bias versus where it is required for your data. So can transformation help in making your model much more robust? Um, one of the important things is that machine learning cannot handle text data. So it should uh, handle only, it, it can handle only numeric data and you have to transform your data to a numeric data, even your text column to a numeric data. And uh, in doing so, you can use something called ordinal encoding. So in our, what ordinal means is it has a rank. So one, two, and three in our data, uh doesn't mean like a red green and blue it means like first class second class and third class and there is a distinction there is a ranking between the new numbers that you have right and then you have one hot encoding so in your survivor or uh, embark the zero or one that needs to be uh transformed into a one hot encoding what one hot encoding means is let's say you have like a red blue and green kind of a data you need to convert it into a matrix that will for red blue and green so from the column content over here a vertical data you're converting it into horizontal you're making it uh, into a matrix where if it is red then uh, it is one over here and zero in blue and green similarly for blue uh, zero, uh, red will be zero and green will be zero, but blue will be one. So you construct a zero or one matrix for your categorical columns. So that is what one hot encoding uh, means. Again, uh, dummy variable encoding. This is required only in case of linear regression. So for example, uh, if you don't have any missing values in your data, instead of having red, blue and green, you can just have red and blue. So if both red and blue are zero, it automatically denotes that it's a green. So linear regression, uh, so the one hot encoding, it doesn't work for linear regression, uh, but for any other machine learning model, uh, it, it, it is okay. Uh, you can use one hot encoding. Uh, okay, before uh, moving on, so. Okay, so this uh, we saw uh, winning for ages. Uh, let us look at another example. Uh, one of the things that we will, uh, you know, often see is class imbalance. We will see what class imbalance mean in later. But let's look at this data. This is a fraud data. Uh, in the sense, there are uh, uh, some fraudulent transactions that are happening. And we have collected some information about all those transactions along with the target variable or, or our uh, objective. Uh, to predict which is whether it is a fraud or not. So in this case, is fraud is our target variable. It will contain zero or one. If it is one, then it is a fraudulent transaction. And if it is a zero, it is a, it is a genuine transaction. So we have 59,000 uh, uh, you know, rows and 434 columns. It's, it's a large data uh, and it has some column uh, description. So we have transaction ID, we have whether it's a fraud or not. It, we have like a transaction DT amount, what product, uh, what card. 
so on like you you have like multiple uh, you know this is like card number and like whether it's a mastercard or visa card which browser they were using so firefox safari etc and this also contains like uh, you know some uh, missing values and these are all like some questions uh, you know with with a, with a true or false answer whether they are you know uh, transacting from a desktop or a mobile whether it is an ios device or android so th these are all the things that we have so from these we need to predict whether the transaction that a person is doing is a fraudulent transaction or not again uh, we are going to look into this so if you look at it only 2000 out of the 59000 are uh, fraudulent transactions right so very very less so so 3% of the transactions are fraudulent and 96% of them are not uh so this is the distribution and uh, we have missing values in this so yeah so this is the percentage of missing values in each of the columns so for example if you look at this this two you have like 93% of them are missing values so these kind of columns you can drop already the dist one is also something you can drop but before you drop this you might also check if there is something called post code or can you derive this this column from address 1 and 2 for example in in most of the uh, countries have their uh, data uh, open source so in india you can go and download uh, you know uh, the uh, postal data from uh, the data.gov.in which will contain you know district street name uh, city uh, state etc so can you look up from this address 1 and 2 and then impute your district 1 and 2 right things like that and then our email domain is 76% uh, blank so you can you can drop all these uh, columns so here what you can do is you can probably set a threshold saying okay anything that has more than 70% uh, missing values those columns can be dropped okay and uh, yeah we are going to uh, fill the missing values with a uh, you know more most frequently occurring method that's yeah so after we impute it we are going to like check whether we still have any missing values so all of them are uh, you know zero so in this exam in particular example uh, we are not uh, excluding this but this is also something that can, you can try and see observe uh, every time you make an action like dropping a column or imputing it you can see how your model uh, uh, differs the prediction accuracy whether it is going up or down Okay, so yeah, coming to one hot encoding. So what we are going to do here is for all the categorical columns, we are going to uh, fill uh, them with mode, and then we are going to use this function called get dummies. What this will do is in one shot for the fraud data that you have, and for all the categorical columns, it will create a dummy variable. So here, if you look at it, this is your uh, original data with four hundred and thirty-four columns, and then your output data has thousand one six hundred and sixty-seven columns. So this is after converting uh, them with uh, dummy variables. So yeah. So if you look at it, it is creating device info underscore rv fifty four underscore rv fifty five etc. So this means these for each and every column. it is sorry each and every uh, unique content in in a categorical column it is a creating a, a, a column so then if 56 is 0 others in this device info rb all of them are uh, 0 so this is what one hot uh, encoding uh, does for you is converting the categorical variables into a numeric variable while also retaining the meaning of the categorical variable okay uh right so going back over here few of the other things that you can do is uh binning yeah this can be done for both categorical and numeric variable and uh, the objective behind this is to like make uh, the model much more robust and prevent it from overfitting so can you uh, of course this also has a cost to the performance so every time you bin something you sacrifice information and make your data more regularized so if you if uh, you want to group everybody 
from 18 to 60 as adult that covers a lot more uh, age group in that and then you lose uh, my minute uh, information or uh, learning that the model can have from that age group so when you are binning it is very important that you also keep in mind that uh, you know, the size of the bin is uh, uniform. So these are the examples. So if you are doing go going to take n is equal to 4 or n is equal to 8 or n is equal to 16. So number of bins is 4, 8 and 16. So this is how your data will be. So you will have, uh, you know, 4 values or 8 values or 16 values. And uh, yeah, moving on. So this is one form. Another thing is log transformation. So what a uh, log transformation uh, does is if your data is extremely skewed, uh, then it helps in uh, handling that. And after transformation, uh, other other uh, important uh, feature about uh, uh, this is uh, the magnitude of order of the data changes within the range of the data. So for instance, the age gap between 15 to 20 may not be the same between 65 and 70, depending upon what problem you are trying to solve. So if you are trying to, let's say, predict survival from COVID, right? So the age gap between 65 to 70 is extremely significant compared to 15 to 20 because people with age greater than uh, 60 are in a high risk uh, zone, right? So that, that kind of uh, differentiation uh, is, uh, you know, uh, Log, log transformation helps in uh, understanding the magnitude of difference. And it also decreases the uh, you know, uh, impact of the outlier. Another thing to keep in mind is that this log transformation uh, cannot handle negative data. So if your data has negative, then you can like add plus one to it and then uh, you know, do a log transformation. So this is something that uh, you need to keep in mind. Scaling, uh, right? Uh, so two type, two types. One is uh, normalized normalization, and another one is standardization. So what normalization means is uh, you multiply x. Uh, sorry, uh, you divide uh, x minus x minimum divided by x max minus x minimum. So what normalization helps is to help you compare data, like for example, you have age and then you have income and you want to compare these two. Say if the increase in age is also denoting an increase in, inco uh, increase in income. So then that is something that, uh, you know, you need to keep in mind. Uh, when, when you are comparing two columns, if they are not on the same scale, you cannot compare. So normali normalization helps you there. Another way, uh, help uh, that this does is if you are comparing two totally different, uh, let's say, group of people, right? Like if you are uh, comparing like people from uh, India and uh, their uh, ability for uh, their resistance or immunity towards COVID versus another group uh, from America, which is uh, immune to COVID. So there also uh, normal normalization uh, helps. Again, standardization is uh, a, a this is based on the mean and uh, or standard deviation. You take a z-score, which is nothing but uh, the difference with uh, the mu, uh, sorry, uh, mu, the mean from the standard deviation. Okay, uh, and another thing is before running the model, uh, we need to split uh, the input and target variable. So going back uh, to this, so here, what we are doing is we are separating the input features. So X is our input uh, field. So we take everything except the is fraud column because that's what that's the target that we want to predict. And then Y is the is, is fraud uh, column, the target variable that we want to predict. What we are going to do is we are going to use standard scalar and then we are going to scale uh, uh, our uh, features, right? So after doing the scaling this is how the data looks so the data all the columns are uh, you know scaled to be able to like compare and splitting the data so another part is another difference you need to understand is the train validation and test split when you get a data you split them into train and validation so train is what you create the model with 
validation is what you use to evaluate the model. So your model learns from the training data. And then you give the validation data to the model. And you test the model to see if it performs very well on this validation. So when you do this train and test uh, validation split, uh, you can do a 70-30 or 75-25. Uh, uh, again, it's it's a thumb rule. Uh, and uh, another important point is you need to make sure that the train and validation is set at uh, random. It's not carefully chosen or uh, you know you go by uh, any of the category like a, like a male or female or something like that. You should always make sure that uh, the split is uh, random. Again, test set, this is what the model is completely unexposed to. So in from validation, the model learns and then again trains. So it's a, it's a cross validation between train uh, and validation set and the model learns. But test is when you deploy the model or before deploying, you test it with a completely uh, new set of data, which the model has never ever seen. Over here, what we have is a uh, X train, X test. So you're splitting the data into train and test. Similarly, you're splitting the Y variable, the target variable also into train and set. The test size is 30%, which means the, uh, you know, uh, the train size is uh, 70%. You can also change this to like 0.25 or uh, something else. And then imbalance data. Uh, before moving on to this imbalance data, any questions, uh, Chanakya, that uh, I can take? Yeah, we can probably take one question. Can you please uh, be a bit more, uh, can you talk a bit more about normalization and standardization? Like when sure. to use which scaling technique? Yeah, probably okay. like now they want to know when to use which technique, standardization and normalization and why. Okay, sure. Uh, see, this you use on a numeric uh, column, uh, of course, uh, and uh, you use normalization and standardization when, let's say, your data does not have any, uh, you know, textbook definition of outlier, but you have some skewed data, let's say. Like, for example, you are someone who target teenagers and you sell your product for teenagers, but sometimes the adults also buy from you. Maybe they are buying it for their of some as a gift or something like that. They are buying it from their profile. You want to normalize that so that uh, the skewness is not too much in your data, right? Like when I mean skewness, it is the uh, dispersion. Like for example, if I go back to the uh, yeah, this example, right? So this is a normal distribution. Sometimes this can also be uh, so the tail can be something lengthy. Uh, and then, uh, oh, okay, I can go back to this example, our age example, and like say, okay, here, if, if you look at it, most of the uh, population is from bin one to bin six, right? Like what you see is thin tail between seven to 10. If the data is skewed like this uh, around bin three and four, and like you have a lengthy tail over here, and you want to normalize this so that you fit it into this, right? So that you want to uh, have a normal distribution with less uh, uh, standard deviation, then in that case, you use uh, scaling. And uh, scaling is when sometimes when you are uh, comparing multiple data sets or uh, when you have different skewness and different uh, data sets, then it is better to use a uh, normalization. Yeah, got it. Thanks. I, I think that's, yeah, we can, we can maybe move on. Yeah, that's right. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, saw this okay what was a uh, class imbalance right uh, what it means is we have a classification problem uh, so we want to predict whether someone survived or not right uh, we have two classes there zero and one yes or no fraudulent or not fraudulent like what we saw in our example in these two cases your observation should be from both the classes on a balanced level 
uh, that's when uh, the model can learn what it means to be a fraudulent transaction or what it means to survive and not survive as well so the model needs to and be able to differentiate between characteristics uh, to be able to predict whether someone will survive or not in a better format so here uh, in a survival or not survival example in titanic you may have certain characteristics like i told uh, they were evacuating women and uh, children and senior citizens first so in survivor uh, survived category you might have these people more right because that's that's what happened and not survived might be uh, people who have who are young but had like some precondition like a, a respiratory problem or people who cannot uh, tolerate cold frostbite anything right so for a cl clear split between uh, one category or one class and another you need the data to be equally split or almost uh, equally split sometimes that might not be the case why because the nature of the problem itself could be like that right so imbalance can occur due to biased sampling for example we have only sampled a lot from a single geographic location uh, or nature of the problem statement like any fraudulent transaction like credit card fraud etc so it might mostly be like you know like like we saw in our data set it could be anywhere between 1% to 5% and then the imbalance could be a slight imbalance like for example uh, the sex ratio the gender distribution as is in the country itself is like some 55% to 45% there you can't uh, you know try to like uh, make it equal so somewhere some slight imbalance is fine and you should like take it because that is how it is in real life as well or in your problem statement as well or severe imbalance like claim prediction in an insurance or fraudulent transaction uh you know uh, chances of having like a thunderstorm in a desert like th th those level of imbalance and okay what we will was a few things the terms that you need to be uh, you know uh, familiar with let minority class the class that has few samples and majority class the class that has many samples how to deal with class imbalance right we can do some resampling techniques uh, we can oversample the minority class right like so oversampling can be defined as adding more copies of the minority class so you duplicate your data so that's why when i was talking about the duplicate data i mentioned that make sure the duplicate is not due to pre treatment or pre processing of the data so you uh, intentionally uh do more sampling from the existing data set itself or add more uh, minority same set of minority data so that uh, your minority class and majority class becomes equal or you can undersample the majority class right undersampling so let's say you have 2000 in our example out of the 59000 uh records we had 2000 of them being fraud so instead of taking the remaining 57000 you can sample and take only 2000 which is equal to your minority so there you uh, you know undersample the majority class so you only take few of them but the drawback is that uh, we are removing some information that may be valuable so you need the 2000 that you select should have good predictability on your model uh, right that, that that's a little bit of a uh, tricky part there and this could also lead to underfitting and poor generalization another method is generate synthetic samples so here we use a uh, in in smooth uh, algorithm which is called synthetic uh, minority oversampling technique so smooth uses a nearest neighbors algorithm to generate new and synthetic data we can use for training our model so let's say uh it, it, what it does is it tries to instead of copy pasting the same data uh, like how you do in your oversampling of minority class here what you end up doing is you create a synthetic sample so let's say if uh, by plotting it plotting the uh, uh, the titanic survivor on the graph and trying to find the nearest neighbors the algorithm might find okay people who have survived have the age group of like uh, let's say uh you know 0 to 35 or uh, they have a age group of let's say 55 to 60 uh what it will do is it will create uh, uh you know data from that range on uh, how close it is to the nearest uh, neighbor 
right so it is called a uh, synthetic sampling of course uh, these are also have some costs in it uh, in terms of you know generalization or uh, how uh, much this should be near your algorithm can you control that k and n uh, the, the k factor there uh, how many neighbors should be uh, close to this etc going back on the code Yeah, so oversampling of minority class. So we use resample uh, from uh, sklearn. And then here, what we are doing is we are joining the you know uh, data back together before. Uh, this is something that is very important, uh, is that you make sure both your target variable, y, as well as your input variable are in your data set before uh, you do any uh, resampling. Because it should, uh, the connection between the uh, input variables and the train is very uh, important. It can't, uh, you know, mix and match between train and the target variable. And then here uh, for the not fraud, because, uh, you know, we are oversampling the minority class for the not fraud data set, uh, you are selecting where, uh, you know, is fraud is equal to zero. And then uh, fraud is where it is equal to one. And then in the upsampled data, you use the function resample. You give your data set, which is your fraud. And then you replace it true, like sample with a replacement. And then what you are saying is that the samples should be length of not fraud. So you want to match your fraudulent transactions as many number of not fraud transactions are there, right? So match the number of majority class. So once you do this in the final, uh, yeah, and then you join that with the not fraud and the fraud upsampled. And then the upsampled data has one and zero together. So both of them have 39,000 now, right? So this is one way where both one and zero have equal uh, split, class split. And then downsampling. Here you do the reverse. You take the not fraud data and then you say, match it to the length of my fraudulent transaction. So you downsample here. So it will reduce or it will take in a random manner as many number of fraudulent transactions are there. So in this example, after downsampling, you have 1,300 in both fraudulent and non-fraudulent transaction. Uh, yeah, a uh, smart synthetic minority. So this is um, this is a direct algorithm that you take from uh, IMB Learn, and then here you give the sampling strategy as one. So what this means is equal class split between one and zero. You can give 0.75 over here if you want to, you know, keep uh, some of the class imbalance or if you want, uh, can give like 0.6 as well. So if you want to, you know, keep that 60, 40 rule instead of both are being equal. Yeah, and then you, uh, you know, do the SM fit, the smooth fit, and then you have your, uh, sorry. Yeah, and then you have your data. Let me show this. Yes. You have 39,000 in both. A any questions on this uh, so far? I guess uh, there aren't any questions as such which are pressing. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people asked what is resampling and all, but I think you have already addressed that. Uh, yeah, so resampling yeah, means you can... from your existing data, you take, uh, uh, you know, more samples or you take you replace your samples. So in, in statistics, what you usually do is you have something called population. 
your entire data set and then you have your sample which is like you take a portion out of it to uh, do some testing but in machine learning we mostly use the entire data uh, but we split it between train and validation and uh, so what resampling means is that like yeah uh, i you allowed to take it from the resample from the same uh, population or same set yeah and some, someone is asking what is lag value uh not sure lag where it was value? used but uh, or log value or yeah. lag value i'm not sure maybe it's uh, yeah maybe we can take and, that uh, uh, offline it's like, okay. yeah yeah later on yeah yeah and someone was also asking like uh, i have read a lot of papers that say oversampling is bad for our model they don't recommend it to handle imbalanced data is that right or we can still use oversampling so what's your uh, take on is, uh, yeah it is yeah. true it is true oversampling is a problem because uh, uh, you know uh, what basically what you are trying to do is like naturally your data is split in like a 99% and 1% uh, but when you have to like so the, the problem with class imbalance is that when you have 99% of uh, you know normal transaction and 1% of fraudulent transaction a default prediction of one will give you a 99% accuracy right but you need to associate the cost with which uh, you have to predict the i mean I, i wanted to use the confusion matrix maybe uh, in a machine after doing the uh, modeling in evaluation of uh, ml algorithms that will be covered uh, what it means is like sometimes your accuracy is uh, okay what you want, maybe let me not use the jargon so what you want to predict is not always the right answer you might want to predict a wrong answer correctly so you want to predict the uh, abnormal transaction with a 99% accuracy so it doesn't matter if you raise a false alarm of a normal transaction most of the times if you are swiping uh, your credit card on a high transaction you will get a call immediately from your bank uh, to say okay did you make this uh, transaction now right it is okay if the transaction is normal and i make that call but it is not okay if the transaction is fraudulent and i let it go right see that's the problem with a uh, class imbalance is that it doesn't predict the minority class very well so to be able to predict the minority class well you have to uh, you know uh, either increase your data set uh, a lot more and then uh, still the proportion will be somewhere between 95% to 5% so you have to do this uh, resampling to be able to uh, you know improve your model so that the false positives are predicted well that that's why we also have uh, you know synthetic sampling in case of oversampling because oversampling is nothing but just repetition of uh, the same data so you might uh, do a smart over a uh, oversample right and also while using uh, one hot encoding right you end up uh, getting a lot more uh, columns that might mm -hmm. also in, uh, basically increase your computational cost as well yes so definitely so someone was yeah yeah so how do you trade off generally in a, a real world setup uh in a real world setup okay so uh, that is why you need to I, I made a, a comment in the beginning. Is you need to be very sure of the column that you take into uh, input for your machine learning model, right? So we call something as controllable variable and uncontrollable variable. Uh, if uh, the model prediction is going to help uh, in a solving a business problem, the input variable, you you actually what you do is you trace the output of the model to the input variable. right so that's how uh, amazon and flipkart are targeting uh, ads to you to say okay you are of this age and you are living in a urban area you are living in a metropolitan uh, you will be interested in fire stick you will be interested in kindle uh, you seem to buy a lot of physical book so those kind of things right like so in that uh, you might want to drop the variables that are not making any sense from the business perspective right like i said uh whether someone is buying from a chrome or a firefox may not be an important input for predicting whether they are going to buy a kindle or not if they are purchasing a lot of books or uh if they are uh, you know 
uh, have been browsing about a lot of books or if they need textbooks or something like that then those kind of variables makes more sense to include than to include a variable whether uh, they are, have logged in from a chrome or firefox so this is why business domain knowledge is very important in uh, uh, you know uh, building ml model uh, as much as the math uh, is required so that you drop off the variables that are not making any sense that are uncontrollable for business decision making and then you use the columns that are required uh for the model okay yeah got it yeah yeah i think uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we can yeah i think uh, right now it's it's questions time right so we are pretty much done with the session if i'm not wrong yes yeah. yes we are great 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 perfect so um how to remove or check columns when there are a huge number of them remove or check yeah remove i think this check. this you have already uh yeah so remove or check uh uh columns is yeah of course you, you have to okay one of the things that i did not cover here but that is very important is uh, getting used to some data visualization tool right like tableau uh, pandas uh, sorry uh, power bi or uh, matplotlib seaborn whatever it is right you have to play around with the data on the data visualization tool to be able to understand how they are distributed how the columns is you can't scroll through like some 15 columns or uh, 50 columns to know the data type and what it contains etc but if you are working on a data visualization tool uh, then it becomes easy for you to understand your data exploratory data analysis is a huge uh, step it, it consumes a lot of time going back to the pie chart i think that's that's where the majority time happens uh, time is being spent right true true yeah that's there also we have another question uh, i think someone uh, is asking what is x train and y train can you please explain yeah, sure uh, sorry uh, if i had skipped to that part uh, maybe let me go back uh, to this so okay let me go back to the slide for yeah so uh, what happens is when we input this uh, our data into the model mm -hmm. we input the uh, data frame of the variable separately and the outcome separately so we split the data into input and uh, target right so input is all the columns like uh, in our titanic example uh, the pre class age gender embark etc and the target variable of was a survived uh, column whether they survived yes or no right so when we uh, build a machine learning model when we say model dot fit uh, we give this uh, x which is the input variables which is all the columns and then y which is your target variable Uh, right uh, what train in that means is uh, that is the set of data from your entire data that you use for training the model so if i go back to that code again to explain uh, yeah so here x train is the independent feature data for training the model uh, y train is dependent feature data for training the model so x train is the input the corresponding y train is the output so row by row what you have here will have an outcome 0 or 1 in this similarly you are splitting the test into the same uh, x and y so when you do that you also split them into train and test you use train data to build the model and test data to validate the model so that's that's what it means x underscore train right right also uh, have sent something on chat on the private chat i think like mm -hmm. you know we spoke about uh, uh, like you know when to do data cleaning and imputation everything right do we need to do before splitting the data or after splitting the data okay. so maybe if you can uh, add some throw some light there yeah right uh yeah so there uh, uh okay um uh so like i if i go back to this slide the data right. cleaning should be done on the train and validation uh, maybe i said uh, test as well but test is the data that is completely unexposed to the model 
so your imputation and the missing values should be done on train and validation and uh, you you uh, uh, deal with them and uh, then you expose this uh, test data where it is not uh, you know probably treated for missing values or outliers yeah. and see yeah. how the model is behaving got it and we are we probably like apply the same techniques right uh, the, the data preparation techniques that we applied mm -hmm. uh, on train data set we would be applying on test so that that works on the model right yeah, yeah. cool got it and uh, we also have one more question um, mm -hmm. uh, so what is the best strategy when it comes to uh, having like you know when you have an imbalanced class data set right mm -hmm. so what is the best strategy that you would go ahead with Typically, see there is it's, not it's a very uh, broad question yeah exactly yeah. there is no one size fits all because you need to like go with uh, you know your uh, 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 the problem that you are trying to solve as well so sometimes yeah. Uh, well, yeah personally i don't favor uh, you know oversampling but mm -hmm. the idea is to start somewhere and then keep on improving so for example uh, what you need to do is to let's say if you do uh, you start with just taking the class imbalance uh, assets uh, instead of splitting them 50 50 maybe you can do it 80 20 right or uh, 85 15 you don't have to always make it like a 50 50 so that the model also understand that one class dominates over the other and then you yeah. can also try various uh, uh, combination in the uh, smooth uh, in the synthetic Maybe for, uh, you know, uh, just repeating the columns, you can move on to the synthetic. Uh, I mean, that, that itself is a topic for another day. <laughs> Maybe we should yeah, uh, true, true, take true. that uh, yeah. separately. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's it's all about experimentation, I think. Uh, that, that's, that's Definitely, it's all about uh, experimentation. Yeah. But today, yeah. at least uh, as a data prep 101, what you should be uh, uh, familiar with is that, like, this thing exists class imbalance yeah. is a problem and that's something that you need to uh, be aware of yeah true true yeah got it uh i think we are pretty much done with the question so most of the questions were either addressed on chat or like you know we picked them in between okay, uh, thanks thanks a lot uh, for that but uh, before we uh, wrap up arti like you know do you have any uh, message to the community based on your experience as an entrepreneur as well as uh, a data scientist your uh, learnings you 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 also are a accountant turned <laughs> data scientist which is not a usual case that we see so sure. probably like you know, we would love to know more uh, from your journey on that bit. okay yeah uh, well uh, there is uh, no easy way but practice practice and practice uh, but for me uh, accounting was my fundamental education but when i joined the uh, ey back uh, in 2009 i directly joined the data analytics team you know those days data science uh, was uh, probably like still uh, in a term that was uh, not very familiar uh, i would join the data analytics team uh, for ey and there i had a chance to you know uh pick up uh, sql and uh, some of the other programming languages that we can use for doing audits so what that means is like when you apply the data science skills on a specific problem that is close to your heart like that you are familiar with and the problem statement that you can associate very well with then you start understanding the data science much more uh, intuitively probably from my background if i had started with a you know like a biostatistics or something like that it wouldn't have made sense i would have uh, you know probably given up long back because i i don't understand uh, biology but because it was on the same field uh, or in the domain knowledge where my uh, background comes from it was uh, very easy for me to connect the dots and understand the math intuitively. So when, when uh, for, for example, I keep talking about credit card transactions, but that's what we use in order to, uh, you know, mark fraudulent transactions in like a purchase uh, or a sales or payment to a vendor or, uh, you know, tax payment or uh, employee bonus. Is there like any, any fraudulent transactions there? So once I start uh, connecting uh, the machine learning uh skill or data science skill to the problem statement that i understand it was actually uh, much more easy from there and uh, then a couple of other things came only with uh, practice huh? like because when when i started in 2009 linear regression logistics regression were very popular we, we did not go beyond that or uh, you know arima for uh, time series 
and then in 2012 i guess uh, when kagel uh, was getting popular 2012 or 13 then xg boost was a uh, uh, something that was everybody was craving about because it was giving like some 0.9 uh, accuracy in the Kaggle leaderboard. And then you have uh, now deep learning and then now, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, buy a GPU machine uh, in uh, co collab or things like that. So to, the problem is you have a lot of resources if you if you are stuck with the code if you are having some problem uh, i mean for example today uh, before getting started on this uh, we were adapting uh, an older code to a newer code because some function was deprecated you just google it you get it but domain okay. knowledge and practice is what makes you distinct not whether you remember a syntax or uh, you know uh, whether uh, if you have like a point 0.9 in a uh, Kaggle uh, score. I mean, of course, Kaggle is important for practicing, but being able to solve a problem using data science is where you will learn a lot more. And that's when uh, your curiosity to ask more questions uh, or approach people who have already done that and, uh, you know, gain from their experience also uh, happens. Yeah, true. Totally aligned. And uh, thanks, thanks a lot uh, for the yeah, wonderful, sure. uh, wonderful piece of uh, advice. Also, there is one more question that we have. This is more mm -hmm. on uh, generic terms. So, mm -hmm. how to? Someone is asking. Just give me one second. I think I just mm -hmm. missed it. Yeah, uh, yeah. How to overcome experience requirements apart from general projects we all do? How to get the interview call? Quite challenging when all are after this field these days. Any oh, any tips? Okay. <laughs> you know, this is that. not just problem for uh, uh, for a fresher. It's also a problem sometimes for the experienced people. Is that like there is sometimes uh, the the word data science in a job description attracts a lot of uh, you know <laughs> applications, whether the person thinks they fit the job description or not. So because of that overcrowding, it's very easy from a recruiter's point of view to ignore you, even if you have. Uh, you know, a uh, great skill. Uh, to replace experiment, uh, sorry, experience to begin with, I would say be very confident and thorough with your uh, math uh, and statistical knowledge. Uh, and also be able to like connect the dots. It's okay if you don't solve a problem from a retail industry or pharmaceutical industry. But if you take a COVID data or if you take a crime data for a city, can you, uh, you know, make sense out of it? Because general knowledge and news is something that we all follow. Uh, right. Uh, uh, like, for example, we talk about first lockdown, second lockdown uh, in Europe. There are some positive things as well compared to first lockdown and the second lockdown. Now the death rate has come down, right? The death rate in Belgium used to be the highest with 14 percent. And now that has come down. So are you able to infer knowledge from the data? That is very important. And uh, the best way to demonstrate that is uh, please uh, start blogging a lot or write a lot published Kaggle kernels, uh, have your code in GitHub. Please don't be shy whether it is perfect or whether it is great. The uh, first step is to try and show that you are trying. Because sometimes uh, when people, uh, recruiters, land on your blog or your GitHub, from your very first GitHub to your latest uh, repository or very first blog to your latest blog, they see how much you have evolved, how much you have learned, which shows your grasping skills and uh, you know passion towards this field. So that, that's something that I would uh, personally advise. I mean, when, when I started, <laughs> the, those things were not there. I, I still have like some died down Kaggle profile, which I stopped touching after 2015. But uh, it, it is very important to do it today where you have some place where you showcase your knowledge. Yeah, uh, totally aligned. And I think that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, we are pretty much done and uh, thanks thanks a lot Arti, for the That's insightful sure. session and uh, I, I believe like you know people can connect to you after the session on linkedin or on Definitely. Uh, slack. i'm, I'm yeah, there on yeah. the slack or linkedin yeah, or yeah. Blah. great yeah. great yeah. perfect perfect thank yeah. you so thanks. much thanks, thanks for this uh, opportunity thanks, and uh, yeah yeah thank you it's our pleasure thank thanks thanks a lot there is a lot of thanks pouring in our okay. thanks, <laughs> i mean thanks, uh, thanks yeah. yeah my pleasure yeah. my pleasure and uh, okay. yeah Thank you. And bye bye. Uh, and, yeah, bye. Uh, take yeah. care, everyone. Stay strong in this COVID times. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.